Um, what are some tips you would have for uh, uh, for beginners or uh, I guess people you know just getting into um, you know the realm of privacy and crypto anarchism? Uh, what tips would you have for uh, those folks uh, that are looking to uh, start locking down their privacy? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and this is something that we do in the, in the first round. Um, we actually do it for big corporations, and we also do it for nonprofits and charities and um, you know just people that need help, right? So the first thing I would say is shut the fuck up. Um, <laughs> stop opening your mouth. Um, I know that sounds harsh, and I don't mean to be rude, but uh, the internet, especially social media, uh, triggers people just to overshare. You know, the, that cat picture you dump or that uh, plate of food that you eat wherever, um, it may have exif. You know, we may be able to triangulate information out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, based on, um, you know, 16, 17 days of your post, you know, a very smart person can come in and create a psychological profile on you. And, you know, if, if the governments can do it, you know, private people can do it. You're listening to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. Visit our website for free resources to aid you in your pursuit of self-liberation. Old Vanu publications, podcasts, guest articles, and much more. Go to VanuPodcast.com. And now your hosts, Shane and Jason. And welcome to the Volney Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to coercion. I'm your host, Shane. This podcast is covered by Bipcot's No Government License. This allows reuse and modification to anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. Learn more by visiting Bip, uh, Bipcot. Org. So before we get into this episode today, I have one quick announcement. Uh, first off, we released a number of new books under Liberty Interact Publications, including the original Vanu book, Vanu Book 2, Going Mobile, uh, which is a van live scene from the 1960s and 70s, uh, and more. Uh, just visit libertyinteract.com. Uh, they're also available on Amazon. And if you're an author looking for a liberty-friendly publisher, we can help with that uh, too. So today's episode is number 56 of, this, of, of the podcast and another one in our Crippley Anarchism series. I'm joined by Assassin, who goes by Cypher Assassin on Twitter. Uh, he is a nomadic cypherpunk specializing in computer security, distributed systems, zero knowledge, encryption, linguistics, uh, and much, much more. So we've been uh, chatting for the past month or so, and uh, I can tell he's got a lot of valuable information to share with us today, uh, which is why I've invited, invited him on to uh, our Crypto Anarchism series. Uh, so without further ado, Assassin, welcome to the uh, Vani podcast. Uh, how are you doing this evening? Uh, doing well, thank you. Uh, appreciate you having me on the show. It's been enjoyable listening to you so far. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, yeah, you know, I, I, I certainly appreciate it. I uh, certainly do. So uh, I suppose to, to, to begin, uh, um, obviously, uh, you know, some, uh, my, you might be a new, uh, new uh, voice to my listeners. So uh, why don't you start by uh, providing a brief overview of uh, who you are and uh, what you do. And uh, then I want to get into your, uh, your very interesting life story. So uh, we'll start there. Sure. Sure. So um, online, I go by Assassin or Cypher Assassin, but this, of course, it's just a NIM. Um, we rotate through those all the time. <laughs> the, you know, the, the nice thing is they don't have much attribution unless you allow them to. Um, myself, uh, I live in uh, a split world currently uh, between first and second round. Um, by daytime, I am a computer security engineer, um, programmer, communications engineer, uh, I also do consulting for large corporations, um, and then by nighttime, I you know uh, moonlight in the second realm. So you know the focus that we have, uh, myself and my small team, is uh, auditing communication security protocols, encryption protocols, uh, experimenting with TACs, uh, experimenting with hardware and software, and you know living. The crypto anarchist lifestyle of the attribution and freedom. And I think that's what we all want, and uh, that's a little bit of what I do. Um, I think there's more to it than that, but uh, if you have any questions, you can proceed. 
Sure, sure. Um, so, so I guess the first thing I'll mention, I, I was going to bring this up later on in the interview, but since, since you mentioned uh, um, that you do security audits, um, now this, this is something I've talked about for, for, I guess, maybe a couple of years now. Uh, you've started on, my other, on the other podcast I used to do, um, but basically the, the value of security audits. Um, <clears throat> now, obviously, uh, you know, having open source software, you know, decentralized software is obviously fantastic, but, um, you know, people can, you know, uh, whether, <clears throat> whether uh, you know, on accident or, uh, you know, maliciously, uh, you know, bugs can get in software. Um, and if we're relying on these things for uh, communications and, uh, you know, uh, exchanging value like Bitcoin or, or whatever, it's important that they work and that they've been audited. So um, I, first off, I just want to thank you for doing that. Because um, I've talked about, um, I haven't really put any, any action to it, but I think there needs to be something, of, you know, some sort of uh, way to... Um, you know, fund security audits for, um, you know, the most popular software. And thankfully there are some organizations that do stuff like that, but I think it needs to be, uh, I think it needs, it needs to happen more often. Yeah, I would agree. Um, the interesting thing, uh, myself, you know, having a programmatic background, uh, uh heavy in the open source and, uh, free software movement is many of the security audits that we do have on software that we write or use, is crowdsourced by the community. Uh, so there are others out there much more talented or much more narrow niche expertise than myself and my team that audit these packages and software, you know, things such as Linux uh, operating system. You know, that's been audited over and over and it's constantly audited by um, crowdsourced uh, engineers and programmers and of course hackers and mm -hmm. security researchers. Um, so I think it's important to allocate resources to this sort of thing. However, uh, the inertia and the desire for, to have secure and free and open software is already there so much that the people that are talented enough to do this um, are already doing it. Uh, you just don't hear about it. Mm -hmm. However, um, companies need to start relying more on third party auditing. Uh, we have, we have a, <laughs> what we call cloak and dagger statement um, that most uh, ego filled security people say, trust but verify. Um, and I, I think that goes along with crypto anarchy. This is trust but verify. Um, you know, by default, you would assume that a piece of software would be safe and secure. Um, so, for instance, uh, I don't know, you know, pick a random tool, uh, I, I don't know, like IRC, like the IRC server that you may or may not use. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> sure, you can tr trust that it's safe and that it's a secure architecture. However, if you're not able to read the code or interpret uh, how the sockets and communication protocols work, then that becomes problematic. And then, mm -hmm. of course, you do need a third a third party to come in. Um, but fortunately, like I said, on the, on the uh, public side, uh, there's tons of people in the community that are open to that and they want secure software by default. Like security is not an option. It's not even a feature. It's just a de facto. Yep. Um, so you just, you'll see more of that. And <clears throat> some of the work that myself and my team do is to try to take new packages that are out there and new software such as ZeroNet and run it through its paces, you know, when it's early alpha or vaporware stage. And, you know, we try to work with developers or teams to help them build better products, but only if it takes um, our attention, right? Mm -hmm. if, if it's something that's interesting or we feel would be a uh, more aligned privacy and security, then we we'll work on it. If it's something like a social network, like if Twitter asked us to audit, we'd probably turn down the work. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Very interesting. So, um, uh, so yeah, I actually did. This would have been uh, last year, uh, maybe like May of last year. I did a video uh, on zero nets um, and kind of showed people around and having kind of how to use it. Because I, I, I when, the first time I used it, I was I was really surprised by the user friendliness of it. Um, you just download it and you just you double click it opens up in the your default browser and then you're in the zero net ecosystem like that was just really really cool um, so I'm, I'm happy you're, you're doing an audit for that one too because uh, you know I'd, I'd love to see that that use more um, I, I honestly don't use it much but I, I like to you know know that it's there as an option and, and since you're doing the security audit on there um, if, that, if that comes back good I might uh, you know get back into it 
Yeah, and actually, uh, it's already been audited by many people, and so far, so good. Um, it, it is reminiscent to us of a software and communication protocol that's also PDP and offline. Um, it's called Scuttle. But I don't know if you've heard of that one before. Oh, yeah. It's actually like a decentralized social network. Oh, yeah. Patchwork. Yeah. Man. I love, yeah, I love, so yeah, I love actually, Scuttlebutt. Correct. Um, the, the way the architecture is built is not too dissimilar from, uh, from ZeroNet. So they share a lot of uh, likenesses. But there's enough differences to make them interesting. <clears throat> the thing that we like about it is that underneath the hood, you know, there's protocols that you can use to essentially ride your own hidden services on top of that. Um, but they do give you a lot of, uh, how do you say, it? bells and whistles baked mm -hmm. in. So I believe they have mail and chat, and, you know, a, a blog type situation. Um, and, you know, we, we like it so far and we're playing with it. Uh, we're also trying to get some of our custom uh, communication servers on it, but uh, it's just as time allows. Sure. But we're going to start writing, we're going to start contributing to the code base pretty soon um, with some pull requests. So we're in contact with that team. Um, yeah, going to see if we can make some progress, hopefully. Awesome. Awesome. That's all. I, I love, uh, I love, uh, yeah, I love that work that you do. That's, that's, that's fantastic. But, uh, yeah, I am, I am familiar with Scuttlebutt. Um, I've got his team. I'm, I, I, it's kind of on hiatus right now. We just, we don't have time for it. Um, and we're, we're working to, you know, get some more financial stability and such, and we'll return to that. It's more of a passion project. Um, but, uh, yeah, there's a project that uh, we're doing called Darklands. Um, it's a decentralized, uh, you know, peer to peer, um, freelancing marketplace uh, for digital nomads. Um, so it'll utilize Bitcoin for uh, payment and and as a part of the reputation system. It'll use a web of trust. Um, that'll be kind of the the main thing that we recommend for for security purposes. Um, and yeah, it'll be it'll be uh, on the Scuttlebutt network. We're just gonna fork uh, fork Patchwork, I think. Um, it's been a while since we talked about it. But I think that's what we're still planning on doing. But uh, I, yeah, I think yeah, Scuttlebutt's fantastic. Um, I mean, there's there's a lot of great software out there right now. Um, and to your point about security audits, it's it's, it's happening pretty prolifically pro prolifically right now. Um, and we just you just don't really hear about it. Um, that's uh, that's really great to hear. And there are a lot of tools, a lot of way, a lot of things people can use to increase their personal freedom, their privacy, and all all of those things. Mm, that is correct, and the the background that I have um, in security auditing and communications, um, it's mostly for big corporations and governments. So um, I like to take that first round work and you know apply that skill set to things that uh, lend to a bet better second round for all of us. So mm -hmm. it's uh, it's rather exciting. And uh, I, I do like the idea of your marketplace. We've actually built something privately um, for people that work with us on a second round, mm -hmm. where if they need uh, they need some sort of work done, you know, whatever it might be, they need assistance. Um, they they have sort of a portal with uh, a UUID type situation on their own cipher, and they can pay um, you know via any sort of uh, cryptocurrency that they like. Um, but yeah, perhaps we can talk about that in the future together. Oh, for sure, for sure. So um, before we get too far into this, uh, I, I want to because uh, uh, yeah, you, you sent it over and it, it sounds sounds like a, an interesting story. Um, uh, I guess could you talk a little bit about um, uh, a little bit about that and uh, kind of how you got to where you are today? Yeah, so uh, I'll try to keep it brief in the name of time. Um, well, myself. Uh, <laughs> I actually hold four citizenships, believe it or not. Um, I travel for a living, um, doing work around the world and trying to slow that down as I'm getting older in age and wanting to kind of have a, have a homestead of sorts. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, I, uh, I started off in, uh, you know, what's now known as the EU, uh, back in Czechoslovakia and, uh, my family was, uh, how do you say, uh, mixed up in some questionable politics. And it wasn't necessarily a safe place to raise a child, you know, back uh, pre late 70s, uh, early 70s. So 
you know, we, uh, we migrated uh, to the States of all places and uh, magically became citizens <laughs> mm-hmm. through the magic of politics. And, um, you know, growing up, I, you know, I, I had, you know, we were a working class family like most Europeans were. So, you know, mom and dad were uh, very busy with, with their sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that left me, you know, just to my own devices. And I was always a curious child. Um, you know, I was fascinated by machines and electronics. And, uh, you know, we're, we're talking many, many, many years ago when things are very primitive. And, uh, you know, I, I think the term hacker would apply, not in, hey, I knocked over Citibank, more like, um, I want to take this radio and make it do something that's not supposed to do. So mm-hmm. natural born curiosity, which was uh, who I was and who I am. Um, er, early on, I realized that uh, I was different. I saw the world in a different way. Uh, I think from a very early age, um, I, I couldn't understand why when you had your mom or dad go to the store and buy a beer or something like that for themselves while they had to show a card like that did not compute in my head um so i realized early on that from birth until death we are constantly identified and that never sat well with me um i was very much uh how did i say uh, rabble rousing uh, in school. Um, I always excelled, but uh, you know it was one of those uh, being an asshole kid and uh, <laughs> didn't didn't do well with uh, authority figures or uh, police or feds or um, you know leaders. Um, I just sort of wanted to do my own thing, and that caused a lot of waves. So early on, I I just knew, like, I I sort of had to stick to myself and my little circle. Um, As I grew older, uh, you know, my interest in things, computers and radio, uh, began began to blossom. And, of course, you know, being a forever student, because, like, currently, you know, I don't know everything. And anyone who tells you that they do is an idiot. Right. Um, you know, I, I was I was constantly trying to learn, and I still am. And you know, I, I enjoy the learning process, and um, that's what I've been doing ever since. And you know, I was fortunate enough to where someone like me and the way I'm built uh, lends well to this sort of uh, vertical and career. And you know, I ended up. Uh, I want to say probably in my early professional first round career uh, mixing in with some organizations that uh, you know I, I don't agree with but you know you kind of get stuck between rock and hard place and uh, you know you're offered work and you know you take it for what it is and move on mm-hmm. and that led to a lot of doors opening both on uh, public private sector government uh, multi-government side um, and it was rather interesting, and I, I've gotten to do things that others, you know, read about. Um, and that's not a braggart or an ego-centric uh, type of statement. It's just actual. Um, but it's it's been interesting, and I, I want to say the breaking point for me was about maybe ten years ago, and I just looked around at the world. And I, I just realized that, you know, everything you do is being collected. Everything you do is being surveilled. Uh, people called me paranoid. People called me insane. But, you know, when I was able to actually show proof to my then friends who now, you know, had abandoned me, um, you know, even with proof, you know, they didn't believe it. But it just hardened me. And in a way, um, I would say it radicalized me a little bit. And... You know, now I I live I live a life that's very much akin to you know what we know as um, traditional and then also modern crypto anarchy. Um, you know, I, I I operate like normal people in a sense. I you know I have responsibilities, I have accountabilities to 
people and things and places. And, you know, of course, Assassin is um, you know, not necessarily a full-time thing, but it's, it's who I am. It's part of who I am. And it's very much second realm and very much uh, off the radar. But, you know, living in that second realm makes me happy. First realm pays the bills. The ultimate goal, of course, is to, uh, you know, be in second realm, you know, most of the time, if not all the time. But I, I just don't think we'll get there anytime soon. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's uh, there's definitely going to be. And, uh, and, and, you know, in terms of Vani, Rayo talked about this back in the 1960s and 70s, not in terms of not in terms of second realms, but in, in, in terms of like Vanu home bases and, uh, you know, like Vanu mini cultures that, um, there's, there's, there's going to be interaction with, with, uh, he called it the Servile Society. Um, but he's talking about the first realm. There's going to be interaction with the Servile Society. There's just no way to get around it. Um, and you know, in my book that I just released a year ago, the updated, for, uh, the updated book, um, I said the same thing that, uh, you know, an alternative economy does not exist yet. So there's going to, there has to be interaction. So, um, you know, like the, um, it makes complete sense to me um, that yeah, obviously there's it's um, for for a while um, there's going to be there's going to be a decent amount of interaction with uh, with the first round, which is unfortunate, but um, you know you got to live uh, you got to live based off reality, right? Yeah, well, it's like I said, you know, first round pays the bills to fund the second round, um, and like I said, we will not see full time second round for quite some time, just. You know, the entire economical system, um, geopolitical space would have to change in a very, very extreme way for that to happen. I mean, we're, we're talking, um, you know, living in that second realm, you have no ID. It's more about reputation and um, that's about it. And um, yeah, it's, it's just not something that will happen overnight. The problem that we see, and um, you've probably seen it, uh, you know, talking to people like Drank and Smuggler, is that the crypto anarchist lifestyle is not for everyone. Um, you know, there's countless people that want to put their face and their Lamborghinis on Instagram or Facebook, whatever it is, and they don't care that their data is being hoarded out and collected and sold and brokered. Um, some of us actually give a shit. And, you know, people like you and the others, you know, we do, and we're, we're a small, excited little bunch. And um, I don't know if we'll grow too much, but the way I see it, you know, well, I'm on this ball of mud. You know, I'm going to do the best I can to keep my data private and the people I interact with uh, private and protected and, you know, hopefully leave the world in a little bit better place than I found it, if that makes sense. Oh yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, yeah, right, right there with you, right there with you. Um, so I guess um, let's get to the, I guess the the first, uh, I guess the first topic of discussion I have planned for for this evening, and it was uh, something you sent over to me. And I'm not uh, not familiar with uh, with the concept, so it's uh, human mixing services and uh, also the theory of identity deattribution. So um, I guess first off, uh, why don't you provide us with uh, kind of definitions here of, of what you mean, and uh, kind of set the stage, and, and we'll go from there. Yeah. So. Human mixing service uh, um, is an idea that, that we coined up, and I, I'm sure it's not an original idea. You know, it's probably been done before, but we're actually writing tooling for it. Uh, so if you've used Bitcoin before, you know there's such thing as tumbling and mixers out there that will ingest a transaction and split it into X delta of transactions, and then you know uh, regenerate it into a target. Um, thus making it not 100% untraceable because, uh, as you know, Bitcoin will bite you in the ass every time. Um, <laughs> people don't like to hear that, but it's true. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so the, the mixing service or the Tumblr, you know, uh, abstracts the attribution from meat space or first round to something else. Um, so we're doing something similar. So let me provide an example. Let's say you're uh, a famous CEO of a pharmaceutical corporation and you have people, you know, wanting to target you on social media or something like that based on something you, you said. The internet has a memory. The internet's a dangerous place. 
So, you know, it's very easy nowadays for someone to use search engines like Google or DuckDuckGo or public databases, whatever it might be, and find someone's house, show up mm-hmm. with a shotgun, push their face and kill them. Um, you know, that's, <laughs> that's definitely a threat model. Right. And so our, our idea is, you know, for the people that are high profile, um, and the, this could be like a service that you could sell, uh, but you know, we want to offer the tooling uh, for responsible usage. You would take a person, let's just say John Doe off the street, and let's just say the, you know, he lives in Kansas, America, whatever, Kansas City, and he wants to hide. His data is already out there. He can't pull it from the data brokers. Um, he's easy to find because he's a singular target. So the tooling that we're writing takes his base information. So again, his name could be John Doe, and it mass swarms all public information sources and databases and data brokers and starts to scramble and fill it with so much disinformation that it's almost like, uh, what is that uh, American book that the kids read? Uh, Waldo or something? Where's Waldo? Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, so the idea is like, uh, I, I think the book, I'm actually looking at it uh, online now. Um, the idea is you see a picture of like a thousand people that look the same. So it's really hard to find the real one. So right. the, the sum goal or the end result is, um, you know, there might be 80,000 John Doe's that live at different addresses and have different phone numbers, but have enough likeness to make them look the same, but it makes it extremely difficult to find the real one. Um, so that's what we refer to as a human mixing service. And it's very much akin to Bitcoin tumbling and mixing. in that if you have enough compute power and you have enough knowledge, of course, it's potentially traceable, but it's a hell of a lot harder. Um, than you know, having a singular John Doe in Kansas City and being able to look him up in five seconds. So we're we're working on that right now, and doing some beta testing, um, actually on on some of our our close first realm friends, and so far it's successful. Um, but you know, like everything else, it's an experiment. So you know, we hope in, you know by the end of the year to release something publicly on GitLab or GitHub or somewhere and just drop it all over and allow people to kind of be everyone at the same time, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That sounds, uh, yeah, that sounds, uh, really cool. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, so you mentioned this again. Um, so I figure we should just go ahead and get it out of the way, um, regarding Bitcoin. Um, so obviously, uh, for, for the listeners, if you refer back to my episode with smuggler, um, and his view paraphrasing, Basically, that's Bitcoin's not anonymous, and you know the, the information's there forever. Um, so it's just it's just bad for privacy and all that. Um, and uh, he also mentioned something about the Lightning, the Lightning Network knows eventually becoming regulated too, because that's kind of what's happening. So, um, but uh, so so I guess what's your take on Bitcoin uh, from a privacy and cypherpunk perspective? Um, well, I will say I, I came from early days of Bitcoin back when um, you know it first originated with the cypherpunks and. I invested and cashed out, so I've, <laughs> I've made some money on it. I, I won't lie about that. Um, but from a privacy standpoint, it's a fucking nightmare because similar to Smuggler's uh, statement at uh, many talks, it's a permanent record of who you are and what you do. Even if you tumble, there's still Bit- Bitcoin and blockchain analysis that can be done. Um, like that recent heist, I think, I forget who the exchange was, but it was something crazy, large amount of money. Um, They're able to track it down in like a day. So, you know, I think it's a good tool, right? Um, So I don't want to dismiss it because we take Bitcoin. Um, But I think if someone thinks, hey, I'm anonymous and, you know, no one can find me because I'm using Bitcoin, then I think they need to probably recalibrate their perceptions a little bit right? and understand what it is. Um, and you're right, also with Lightning Network, um, regulation is coming. It may already be here, we don't know yet. You also see 
banks wanting to get in on cryptocurrency. Um, you know, I, I think uh, I think JP Morgan Chase in the States is <clears throat> working on their own coin if they haven't done it already. Um, there's other banks talking about it. And all it takes is one massive bank or financial institution to adopt it. And then it's instant regulation. And then, oh, right. You know, there, there's no more. Yeah, there's no more pseudo privacy. There's no more um, feigned de attribution. It's just it, it's just like cash, or actually, it's worse than cash. It's like a check. Um, <laughs> and sometimes we joke about that. Like Bitcoin is is like the modern checkbook, like writing a paper check because it can be traced and signed, and you know it's got a signature. Um, so so yeah, I I think it's a good tool. So. You know, I, I don't dismiss it. You know, we use it often, but you know, th there's got to be other technologies, and you know, it's, I don't think they're there yet. Things like Monero and uh, Zcash, which you know may or may not be better depending on your use case. But in general, um, I, I do like Bitcoin. I just think that they can do more probably, and um, it's just not we're not seeing it yet. So I I would not like myself or people around me, I would advise like if you want to be 100% anonymous, like a ghost, which is pretty much impossible anyways, definitely don't look at Bitcoin as your first tool. Um, just use it for what it is and understand the risks and go from there. Right, right. <clears throat> so um, I'll kind of ask the same question, same question I asked Smuggler, but it's a different interview, guys, so um, with different answers. Um, but, you know, I, I, I guess the difference is, though, I had tried, the, tried this, uh, this piece of software out before I interviewed Smuggler. So um, I guess over the past few weeks, I've been, uh, you know, testing out uh, Wasabi Wallets, uh, you know, an hour here and there when I have time. Um, and I was able to make a deposit in there. That was cool. Um, and um, I did some, uh, they have the, their coin join thing, their uh, Xiaomi and coin join. Uh, that was cool. Um, you know, I went on the test net and, and uh, you know, mess around with that. And I think, uh, you know, it's a, it seems like it, it could maybe mitigate some of the privacy risks inherent in Bitcoin. So what do you think about like Wasabi and uh, maybe Samurai and uh, other tools like that? Uh, do you think there's, uh, that, that this problem could be solved or is Bitcoin just fucked? <laughs> Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I think, <laughs> I think there's potential on, uh, for these sorts of technologies to solve the problem. Um, oh, we've not used Wasabi extensively. We've actually audited Samurai. Mm -hmm. Um, so for, from a base standpoint, they're pretty good tools. Do they really do what they say? We don't know. We have to do further analysis. Is it better than say going to um, you know a GDAX or a Coinbase or a Kraken and uh, taking fiat and then directly sending it to you know someone for you know whatever purposes yeah absolutely it's better but you know you have to understand that you're putting a lot of trust into people that claim something so again it returns to the beginning of our talk today where we talk about trust but verify um, as long as the code you can audit and you understand how the network works and you're comfortable with what risk may or may not be there i think it's fine but who's to say that um, x vendor or x company creates a wallet or creates a tumbling service or whatever it might be and they are very open about their code base here here you go take a look but what if they're really writing something different? We don't know. How, how are we going to know? Mm. Um, of course, you know, on, you know, on a peer to peer network, you know, you, you will be installing that software and it will communicate, but there's always the option that, you know, they could be doing some sort of logging. Like we see in the VPN space, everyone lies about that. Of course, um, you know, they could have some sort of altered code that, you know, runs a node as it should, but, Maybe there's other code we don't know about. So myself, I, I don't know. I I think these tools are fine and they're better than you know using your credit card and uh, probably even paying cash in some instances. But you know, I, I think we need more time to discuss them and more time to explore them. Um, just because it's new and hot and 
this buzzword doesn't mean that it's very good. Um, it could be good, but you know, we have no way of telling without some more user experience because both are relatively new compared to the you know, origin of Bitcoin. Um, as far as Bitcoin itself, solving the problem, I, I don't know. It's, it's really hard to say. Yeah. I, I don't even know if I can answer that question. It's, <laughs> it, 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 it's almost like another talk, to be honest. Sure, sure. Understood. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's 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 certainly a, a sufficient answer. It's uh, um, kind of uh, the. It seems like it's kind of the general agreement between cypherpunks, um, which it which mm -hmm. it, it it makes sense. You know, it really does. That's that's why and I've, I've said this before for for my listeners, but for for your sake, I mean, that's why I like Monero so much. Um, I guess over the past couple of years, until until last year, really, um, until um, I had so many damn issues with their um, their their uh, their wallet. Um, but it was the fact that Bitcoin, you know, there's some some problems with privacy, and Monero is, you know, promising to deliver privacy, so that seemed like a better bet. Um, but uh, so, you know, I, I can I can still see that a little bit. Um, but as far as Zcash, um, I don't like the trust the uh, the trusted uh, setup, um, where um, and I guess from how I understand it, there could be hidden inflation, no one would ever know, um, except for the. Uh, the the, tr the people involved in the trusted setup. So um, I don't really see Zcash as an option, even if I'm even if I'm not looking at it from kind of a more more of a maximalist perspective. Um, I don't even see Zcash as an option. Um, it's more more kind of relies on the narrow. Um, and I don't know how I feel about their <clears throat> their ASIC resistant uh, mining scheme. I'm not really sure. Yeah, um, it, it's like we talked about in some of our private conversations that. You know, <laughs> sometimes it's almost easier to just exchange cash mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, even barter services. That's uh, threat model and I, that's a lot of what we do. So, you know, maybe you, you have something we need, you know, maybe we need a domain name or um, maybe we need 18 years of VPN or, or maybe we need server space for a project. So we may do some work for you and, you know, trade goods. Um, that's something that many people don't rely on. They're, they're so hyper-focused on currency, 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 money. Um, but the way we think here in our team is uh, if we don't have to spend money and we get goods in return or just you know, giving our, our work and attention and time, that's a transaction right there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's it's a hell of a lot less traceable right. than, you know, putting something on chain or um, running something through your bank account or something like that. So I, I encourage your listeners and the people that we talk to to never dismiss the power of barter. It, it's amazing what you can do with a simple barter. Oh yeah, yeah, and, and I'll, I'll go back to, to Rayo, one of the main the, the one of the main proponents of Vanu, and he wrote an article on uh, ethical enclave trading back in 1967. It was basically uh, it's basically just agorism, um, just without the revolutionary strategy involved, um, <clears throat> just as a way to maybe advance yourself, you know, save your, save yourself some money on taxes. Why not, right? You know, out of your out of your own self interest, why wouldn't you save some Why wouldn't you save some money and not give it to the state? Um, but yeah, he talked about barter, and that uh, the only way that um, Either either party is at is at risk, is if one of them tells. Um, so if you're working with people that you trust, then barter is um, about as damn secure as you can get. Yeah, so I would agree. And if you saw Smuggler's talk where he talks about the all or nothing type systems and protocols, um, that's you know it, it depends on your barter, of course. Um, but, you know, let's say Mr. X and Mrs. Y um, have some sort of transaction. They put up some sort of escrow to ensure everything is executed properly. Everyone leaves at the end of the day or night, you know, with what they need and um, their reputations are at stake. Um, you know, so having that, that all-in mentality of, hey, uh, we're mutually fucked if this thing fails is sort of motivation to have you know good tradesmanship and you know, you know keep a healthy exchange between two people. So, but yeah, you're right. If someone tells or you know uh, uh, starts to attribute, then things fall apart. But right, uh, I guess 
take your business partners wisely. <laughs> right, and I think Ray also made a suggestion. Uh, apparently, back in the day, I never heard of them. Maybe they maybe they exist today. I don't know, but things called like barter exchanges. Um, he said, you know, back in the, I guess maybe the early seventies, um, people were evading taxes that way, you know, just bartering instead of, you know, exchanging cash. And, um, eventually, you know, snitches showed up at these barter exchanges and people got in trouble. So, um, I guess his other suggestion was don't join like a barter exchange, like a public one that you find in a classified newspaper, you know, classified out of new as a, out of a newspaper. That seems ridiculous anyway, but, um, he pointed that out. I don't know if it has any, any, you know, validity to it, but I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, so actually, if you look, um, I am not aware of public marketplaces like that. Uh, we've actually bought a writing one just for fun. Um, but if you look on like Craigslist, there's a barter section where people will say, I'll trade oh, you a yeah. wheelbarrow for a motorcycle. Yeah, so that's, I think that's probably as close as we're going to get to it at this point. Sure, yeah, as that's far true. As, um, you know, it, more of an anonymous barter exchange, but you know, now it's getting to the point that when you meet someone at Craigslist, because there's the whole Western American stranger danger paradigm, that, <laughs> right? Oh, <laughs> you know, you you let's say you sell a, I don't know, what, what's popular on Craigslist, probably like a bicycle or a Chromebook or something like that. When you sell it to the person, they want the receipt and they want your ID. Um, they they want to take a picture of you and your car and it's like <laughs> fuck you the, 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 you know it's this this is an exchange you know whether it's for money or for services or you know, some sort of trade um that's the beauty of having these marketplaces where we don't have to identify to companies you know like uh you know the, the stores um amazon or mm -hmm. google or facebook or whatever you know, we can we can have these private transactions and it's okay and everyone walks away happy and that's that's the goal right yeah yeah um yeah we we, we obviously talked about that uh, that before but um i've never ran into that actually it's basically if you can if you if if one of us can test that test out what we're selling we can like if if i'm selling an xbox and i meet some guy at a walmart Obviously, you can't test it out. So there's, you know, kind of that you got to kind of trust the other person. They're not going to scam you. Um, and I've I've never been scammed on Craigslist. I've sold a lot of shit on Craigslist. I bought a lot of shit on Craigslist. I've never been scammed, and I've never asked one for their ID or for any shit like that. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it's yeah, you're right. It's a stranger danger thing. I mean, I I kind of go by um, even if their politics are ridiculous um, and they advocate violence against me through the voting booth or via voting booth. Generally, like in real life, when you meet when you meet up with people. Um, they're they're mostly good right um if you kind of go by that assumption it's a very small minority of the population that's just outright violent and psychopathic um and most of those people are in government right. so <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that's true um like like i told you before uh, in our private talks I, i've had a couple of situations where people try to take pictures of me or people around me and, and this is not just in the united states but we're talking about europe which is very privacy oriented and it's you know, not only is it an invasion of our privacy and our um, attribution and identity, it's, it's just plain rude. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I, I learned to keep computers and not not sell on those public marketplaces so much or, you know, find local shops that I trust. And, and I think that's a lot of what it's about is finding people that you... You don't necessarily have to identify to, but um, you build that that trust. You build that reputation to where they know, hey, Assassin always has Chromebooks because he goes through them like water. And so-and-so always has his phone. So let's get them together and they can trade all the time. Mm -hmm. And they have this constant supply chain of gear going back and forth. So, um, and they still aren't attributed. You know, They're not identified. They're just two random people. So... Right, right. And I want to go. I want to emphasize real quick, um, just for, for for the listeners here. Um, so um, the 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 core aspect of of uh, crypto anarchism and you know cypherpunk is is the attribution where actions aren't attributable to to you. That's why the use of pseudonyms is so um, so prominent. Um, <clears throat> So um, I'm I'm liking. I mean, it, it overlaps very nicely because the only 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 two people I've heard talk about crypto anarchism in this way of deattribution is you and Smuggler. 
um, generally across the internet. And I mean, I was guilty of this. I just continued rolling with it because it's it, we've been doing this series for a year. Um, so um, we talked about things that I guess you and Smuggler wouldn't consider crypto anarchism, like 3D printing guns. Um, we've, we've continued talking about those things. I think there's uh, there's some some good stuff there. And even if it's not, maybe technically, um, G, the the point is that, you know G, you know in, in general public or I guess in our, our small minority of the general public, crypto anarchism is a lot of things that I guess you guys might think it's not. Yeah, it's, um, I'll say that myself or anyone else, you know, what everyone needs to define their own truth, right? Um, you know, there's, there's perceptions and why they accepted, um, idioms and constructs of what crypto anarchy or what anything is. Um, and you can either accept it or create your own reality. So you don't have to rely on someone like me or, or you know, some other person on the internet to define your life and what you believe in, how you execute. But yeah, um, you know, having, you know, having things like 3D printed guns is an interesting concept, and it's not something that I'm against per se. Um, but yeah, is it conducive to? Crypto anarchy? Probably not. Just in the same way, like um, buying a Ferrari is not crypto anarchy. Um, well, I, I suppose. Yeah. And I, I guess. I guess. I, I guess. I just thought of this, but um, I suppose. I suppose three D printed guns could be a could be a part of crypto anarchism and deattribution because um, if you're printing your own firearm and it's untraceable. Um, then there is deattribution there, right? Um, and there's untraceability. So I think that I think it may actually it may be able to pass on that um, on those grounds. But what the hell do I know? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think to an extent, and you'd probably want to refer it back to Ivan the Troll on this one. But you know, there's certain parts of the weapon that would have attribution. Yeah, you know, perhaps uh, the top slide. Um, I'm not an expert in firearms, but you know, certain parts can't be printed yet um, right you know so ideally I, in an ideal world you know if you want to if you want to take the framing and apply it to um, that item as far as like a 3d printed firearm you know what you would need to do is have some sort of composite or polymer type uh, weapon that's 100 percent printable um, you would need to have ammunition um, that was very much abstracted from you um, I, right. I won't get into how that would be done, but you know, you would have to uh, break that yet that attribution um, throughout the entire process, not it, just for it's, that it's one. It's very hard. Right. Correct. Correct. Yeah, it has to start from the beginning, from even where you source your filaments, from where you source your three D printer. Um, you know, I, Ivan had mentioned you know going on Amazon and buying this. Sure, that's fine for just a gun advocate or you know, someone that wants to tinker and experiment. Um, but if someone wants to apply that to crypto anarchy, as soon as you buy it from, you know, the computer shop or what have you, then there's attribution and it's a total failure. Fair uh, enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Valid point. Yeah. I, I yeah. I'm back. I'll, I'll backtrack on that one a little bit. Yeah. It's gotta be, uh, uh, you know, non, non attributable at all steps in the process or it's uh, kind of a moot point. Yeah. Um, it's like, if you try if, if like say that, say that, uh, coin base, uh, you know, had, you know, it started, started, you know, trading Monero, it'd be like buying Monero on Coinbase and then thinking that you have anonymous cryptocurrency. Right. Um, ridiculous, <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> so I guess, uh, we've been talking for about 45 minutes here and I, I don't want to, I don't want to keep you too much longer. So I guess, um, a couple more questions for you and I guess we could kind of do, uh, um, more, uh, you know, more quick answers. I don't want to, I, I, I want to respect your time. Um, so I guess, um, one of the most important questions I think, um, especially from someone with as much experience, uh, as you have in the first and the second realm, um, what are some tips you would have for, uh, uh for beginners or uh, I guess people, you know, just getting into, um, you know, the realm of privacy and crypto anarchism, uh, what tips would you have for uh, those folks uh, that are looking to uh, start locking down their privacy? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and this is something that we do in the, in the first round. Um, we actually do it for big corporations and we also do it for nonprofits and charities and um, you know just people that need help, right? So the first thing I would say is shut the fuck up. Um, <laughs> stop opening your mouth. Um, I know that sounds harsh and I don't mean to be rude, but uh, be 
the internet, especially social media, uh, triggers people just to overshare. You know, the, that cat picture you dump or that uh, plate of food that you eat wherever. Um, it may have EXIF. You know, we may be able to triangulate information out of it. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, based on, um, you know, 16, 17 days of your post, you know, a very smart person can come in and create a psychological profile on you. And, you know, if, if the governments can do it, you know, private people can do it. So be careful what you see on the internet. It has a memory. Um, and if you're going to say something, uh, make sure it's abstracted from you. But we're talking about normal people. So the best thing to do is keep your accounts private. I know that seems like an antisocial thing, but until you get into good, sane habits, um, you know, limit who you connect with and start to get to know them. The idea of being social on the internet, um, you know, back 20 years ago, it was different. We had communities and you know, there was trust and it took time to get to know people and uh, things were slow. Now things happen at like a neurotic speed of light. Mm-hmm. So everyone's quick to trust without verifying. So be careful of what you say and who you connect with to start with. As far as tools, um, we have a, a huge list and I, I'll actually follow up after the show um, probably within the next day with a, a nice list you can put on your website. Fantastic. But, uh, let's say you yeah, let's say you're a normal, you know, average person using a computer. Um, get rid of Google Chrome. Um, get rid of Brave. Um, you know, use things like Firefox and you know, use plugins like HTTPS everywhere. You know, use an ad blocker of some sort, whatever you like. Uh, uh, I think um, different settings within Firefox. Uh, that will make you um, not untrackable and not anonymous, but at least help, you know, keep you from being tracked by online retailers who use third party and first party tracking cookies. Um, and you can still have a functional internet with that. Oh, yeah. Again, you know, that's something that you know, perhaps I can write a guest article for you or just sh- shovel you some information. Oh yeah, please do. Yeah. Uh, other than that, yeah, other than that, um, I will definitely say that uh, VPN is important. Uh, most people shy away from the whole VPN situation because it's too technical for them. But there's, you know, a lot of companies out there that, that do a good job. Um, you know, I, I don't really endorse any publicly, but you know, they have clients for your phones and your computers and your tablets, whatever, and they make it easy as a click. Even if they're logging, for the average person, who cares, right? But it's better than nothing. Um, you know, so start there because. 99.999% of us are not doing anything ominous or nefarious. We simply want our data to belong to us. That's it. So if you can encrypt and encapsulate your connection, you're much better off than you know being at a, a coffee shop with open Wi-Fi and doing bank transactions. That's very dangerous. Mm-hmm. So spend a little money um, on the VPN. Um, I, I will give a shout out to crypto hippie yep (laughs) Um, they have a really yeah yeah they have a really nice vpn uh myself and my team uh recently subscribed and tested it we like it quite a bit so we will likely publicly endorse that um eventually and we're actually working on our own service but it's really for our own use but yeah have a vpn um i also encourage people to use tor uh there's a lot of negative light that's shed on Tor because, oh, hey, the dark nets and Silk Road and cyber criminals. Sure, they use it too, but it was invented by the Navy and it was invented by scientists and it was meant to keep people private. You know, it's still endorsed by EFF in the States. Tor project's thriving. Um, granted, it, you know, it, it can be reversed and hacked, but it's still better than nothing. So, um, you know, when you can't use Tor, but it is very technical to set up. So I always, you know, suggest that people use the actual Tor browser package that comes from mm-hmm. torproject.org. And hopefully you can uh, set a link to them as well. Yep. Um, so, I mean, that's some basic stuff as far as like online safety. And, and, you know, we can go on and on and, you know, perhaps we'll have follow up conversations on, mm-hmm. you know, focus just on privacy versus crypto anarchy. Um, 
but you know, one thing I would like to point out is physical privacy and safety. Uh, that's also something we consult on uh, physical perimeter security. Um, in this day and age, it's <clears throat> no matter if you're in the Western world or the you know other continents, you know the world's a dangerous place. You know, so having deterrence is nice. You know, whether it be a canine or some sort of uh, weapon, depending. It doesn't really matter what your political stance is. I don't care. You know, just being able to defend yourself. Um, you know, you're being surveilled 24-7. Why not surveil the outside world? And what I mean by that is, you know, have your cameras in place as long as you understand the technologies and they're not phoning home to China or Russia, mm -hmm. like a lot of these mass cameras do, or they're not, like uh, we just saw an article today, I think the Amazon, uh, the ring service with the doorbell is now sending information to law enforcement. We feel that's <laughs> very bad. Yeah, wow. <laughs> so... Yeah, so, um, you know, keep an eye on that. But, you know, have these protections in place. Uh, and I think overall it's about keeping your head on a swivel and having situational awareness, watching your six, as they say, in the military. Um, understanding what your threat model is. You know, are, are you low risk? Are you high risk? Um, and, again, that's something we can talk about later. But, you know, just those basic things, you're better off than 99 some of the people out there who just don't give a fuck. They just, you know, they want to they wanna have an hour-long YouTube live stream of, hey, I'm eating 10,000 calories of fucking pizza, and look at me, and look at my house. Oh, great. Now we know where you live and, you know, what your dog's name is. And, um, oh, we know how to enter your house. People don't realize what they put out there, and I think they just need a wake-up call sometimes. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I certainly agree. That's 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 great advice and stuff we've talked about on this podcast. Uh, um, practicing the gray man, uh, um, yeah, situa situational awareness, um, all that. Yeah, you're right. I mean, uh, one of the things we've talked about a lot on this podcast is that uh, you know coercion is everywhere and it's never going to not exist. Right? Um, there's always going to be violators of person and property, and uh, so volume and security culture and crypto anarchy, um, all of these things will always be um, necessary because even if uh, you know the state's abolished tomorrow, um, there's still private criminals. Um, so there's there's still people to keep your your uh, your private data um, from um, even if it's uh, not a state apparatus so um yeah, I guess I don't really. I, uh, we've got. Uh, we, we we should certainly. We should definitely have uh, another conversation. There's quite a bit we didn't get to, um, but uh, yeah, this was uh, this was uh, a lot of fun. I guess um, the last question I'll ask you is: uh, Do you have any uh, any other closing thoughts for the listeners uh, or anything you'd like to uh, to like to plug uh, before I let you go? Uh, no, because I'm not a capitalist, but, um, actually, you know what? I would actually like to say thank you to all the crypto anarchists out there that are, um, instrumental in the movement, no matter what their position is. Um, every little bit helps, I think, um, to create this magical thing that we have and to contribute to other things like, um, you know, home studying and on and second realm. Mm -hmm. um, so the work that you all do out there um, is important and near and dear to us and we're there with you and we have been for decades it's just we've not really surfaced until recently um, second I, I will say that this world's a lot different than it was 40 50 years ago and you know if we don't fight and do what we have to do to protect our liberties and freedoms agnostic of what country we come from and uh, dwell in um it's going to be a slippery slope and i i'm afraid for our children and the next generations so that's why i do the things that i do um to hopefully make the world a little bit of a better place and um i'm hoping that i'm not alone and i don't think i am so and third um the people that are in your circle, be good to them because they can disappear in a second. So, you know, really give a shit about your, your squad. You know, keep the people in your circle tight. Um, love them, cherish them, treat them well. And, you know, of all, don't be a dick. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Very good. Yeah, that's a, a great way to uh, to close out the podcast. Uh, so yeah, uh, thanks a lot for coming on, man. Uh, we should definitely definitely do this again. Um, 
yeah, a lot of a uh, lot of valuable information. I will say, uh, you know, guys, the crypto anarchism series is going to continue. Um, I've got uh, the next few weeks are going to be busy. The Mid Midwest Peace Liberty Fest is coming up, and I got some uh, some final prep work to do for my uh, second realm talk I'm going to give there. Um, so I've already scheduled the scheduled the post out. There's going to be a few intermission episodes. Um, so the crypto anarchism anarchism series will go on until probably July. So um, we should definitely uh, definitely have another talk. Um, you know, come up with some sort of subject that'd be super relevant and, uh, you know, super important for, uh, you know, my listeners to take away uh, as part of the Crypto Anarchy, Anarchy series. Excellent. Right on. Well, uh, thanks a lot, man. Uh, I really appreciate it. And for you guys listening, thanks for, uh, you know, thanks for tuning in. Um, so yeah, check out the website, volneypodcast.com for a bunch of resources, uh, podcasts, guest articles, uh, all that good stuff. And obviously, Liberty, Liberty Intertech Publications, Liberty Intertech, uh, com. So until next time, let's build the Agora and let's build Second Realms. Is it possible to create pockets of freedom where personal autonomy is respected? In the novella, Hashtag Agora, Daniel LaRusso finds out the answer firsthand. After discovering Bitcoin, he becomes immersed in the cypherpunk underground. Encryption, ghost pads, temporary autonomous zones, and much more. He learns the benefits of freedom, of these tools for self-liberation, and how truly free individuals could conduct their affairs outside of the servile society. Based on real individuals in modern-day Berlin, Germany, Hashtag Agora gives you a practical representation of how freedom pioneers can carve out pockets of freedom in an otherwise enslaved world. Get your paperback copy today by visiting tinyurl.com slash agoraanarchy. Again, that's tinyurl.com slash agoraanarchy. And for more titles like this, please search for Liberty Under Attack publications on Amazon.